Recording has started. Recording has started. So, uh, wonderful. Um, so I'll go ahead and just kick us off real quick and turn it over to Jason. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the November installment of our Microsoft Cut to the Chase technical briefing series. Uh, we put these together for our customers uh, in, uh, in the Midwest, St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha, what have you, uh, with the goal of uh, providing a uh, technical training on some of the uh, the latest and greatest Microsoft technologies just to keep you educated and up to speed on all of the uh, the new releases, the uh, the updates, the feature sets that you can take advantage of with your existing and future Microsoft investment. Today we're going to be focusing on the updated security features of uh, Windows 10 and uh, what we try to do is always bring uh, uh, subject matter experts in, people that are actually in the field that are leveraging and working and deploying this technology every single day. So uh, very excited to uh, introduce uh, my good friend and colleague Jason Rutherford, managing partner at Model Technology, a very strong Windows 10 and infrastructure partner uh, headquartered in St. Louis. And he is going to be the star of the show and take you through the lion's share of this presentation. Um, we will be uh, uh, like I said before, previously, we'll be taking uh, questions. You feel free to put those questions in the IM window. I'll be, be feeding them that there's specific things you want to know and working to get, get answers for them. But we will also provide some Q&A time at the end. So uh, very excited to kick this off. And Jason, I will turn it over to you. Great. So thanks, Jeff. So uh, hi, everybody. Um, so as Jeff said, this is part one of our Cut to the Chase series. and. The series as a whole will be focused on securing the modern workplace. And we'll look at a couple of different aspects as we go through parts two, three, and four. Um, but part one is really focused on the Windows 10 aspect or the endpoint of it. And um, to help level set some expectations here, the goal is to introduce you to some of the Windows 10 terminology and how to make these features really applicable in your organization. Um, typically, I like to do a lot of demos. Um, anybody that knows me knows I'd rather be in the technology than into PowerPoint. Um, however, what I've felt is that going through the updated security features in Windows 10, um, it's best to get the educational piece of it kind of out of the way. And to do that, it's best served in a PowerPoint. Now, I don't want that to, um, you know, to uh, sour your taste for the other ones as they will be much more technical and they will go into the demo aspects of those pieces. Um, but there's a lot of good information that um, I found is just, it's not been consumed by a lot of the folks out there that use Windows 10 in, in, the, in the infrastructure. So, um, so as I go through, I'm gonna refer to industry specifics where applicable and try to make the scenarios real to try to depict solutions and not tools. Um, but when we do this, we're going to define some business value of the features and technical value of the features. And to understand what the hard and soft ROI is on the investments, the hard ROI is, of course, dollars. And the soft ROI is the perception or the user experience, which is a really important thing when you're rolling out a big change into an organization that end users consume on a daily basis. Um, another benefit would be improving operations for support staff, making things easier, right? Onboarding, offboarding, things like that. But um, uh, ideally, we want to turn our operations, our infrastructure operations, into a value added resource for the business. And I've heard that infrastructure for years now be referred to as plumbing or utility. But if you think about it in terms of smart homes or um, tankless water heaters, right? Things are in your house that are just utilities, outlets, pieces like that. Um, those utilities are now driving value and efficiency. So let that carry over into the workplace and, and think of infrastructure as value add into the business. And so again, we're gonna be using technical terms. We're gonna talk technology. Um, we'll go as deep as you need to. So as you ask questions in the chat window, um, I will respond to them at the end. I know Jeff will, and some of the other Microsoft folks will be kind of fielding them as we go along. Um, but feel free to ask the questions that you want to ask. And if we don't know the answer, we will certainly get it to you. Um, but again, we're going to introduce you to the terms and translate those into value that you can walk away with and from a security perspective on the Windows desktop. And then at the very end, we'll also have some time for questions as we go on. So. The introduction will come next. Um, then we'll talk about the Windows 10 security features, which will be the bulk of the presentation today. We will cover modern management. <clears throat> if you are unfamiliar with modern management, 
it's important from a security aspect as well as a um, an, a value add um, aspect to your organization. So we'll we'll talk about that. What that means. We'll talk about Windows as a service because it's really important that everyone understands how to operationalize this technology. It's not enough to deploy it these days. You have to understand how to make it part of your um, your ongoing updates and operations, and we'll get into that. And then we'll leave some time for questions if we don't field them at the end. But first, a little bit about model. So um, we're a Microsoft Gold partner. Uh, we have two different lines of service. We have a consulting line of service and a managed services line. And so our consulting uh, team are experts that come in and can design and build and help you operationalize things like OMS, EMS, Azure IaaS, all things System Center, Windows 10, a lot of the core infrastructure pieces. Um, and then we have a managed services uh, division as well that can help you further operationalize those to free up some of your engineers from the daily grind and let them focus on building the business while things like patching and image servicing and things like that are just going to get done according to SLAs. So overall, we stay pretty focused into our area of expertise. Um, it's, it's something that we found to be very successful. We are extremely deep in all of our technologies that we do. Um, about me specifically, I'm the managing partner of Model Technology Solutions. This is my 16th year in professional IT. Most of it has been in consulting. Uh, I've got two kids and a lovely wife. I'm a CrossFit enthusiast. And what seems like forever ago, I was the technical editor of the Mastering System Center Configuration Manager 2007 R2 book. And more recently, I was a contributor on the Microsoft white paper, the release pipeline model in 2016. Um, most of most all of my career has been spent in infrastructure and kind of around the system center aspects of it. But so let's go ahead and dive into the, the meat of the content here. Um, so the security features and keep in mind that any one of these topics could be uh, an entire presentation of hours to cover on their own. So in the interest of time, we're going to cover the topic from a high level. We're related to the business value that can drive um, in your organization. And then if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to ask. So um, we'll start out by stating some obvious things, right? So there's a lot of new malicious files that are created every day, right? It seems like the, the people that are creating these things are working endless amounts of hours to try to destroy our organizations. And the traditional antivirus and signature-based detection methods they're just simply inadequate for what needs to exist to, to combat these pieces. So if you think about the processes that we employ today, right? So we have an agent running on a box and we sit and wait for an exploit to be found. And then we wait for the vendor to release an update to our client. We eventually go get that update. We push it out all by just kind of waiting and hoping that we don't get attacked. Right. I mean, that, that's the traditional mindset of an antivirus today. Um, these applications are free to run and we hope hope we catch the threat before um, with the definition update before it actually hits our environment and creates chaos. Right. So these unpieced, unwanted pieces of software could run until we tell them not to do so. Right. But in many environments, the uh, this traditional mindset still exists and is considered a layer of security, which, as you probably have read in the news over the last several months, there's been a lot of attacks and it's not, it doesn't seem to be working very well. I've been told several times in my career that hope is not a strategy. And so by hoping that your signatures update prior to being compromised, it's probably not gonna work to, in today's world, right? To further the point um, of security needs on the, on the desktop, um, employees can inadvertently put your environments at risk, right? So we used to set up perimeter networks at the edge and we were safe because we had firewalls in place. And, you know, now there needs to be intelligence behind combating the attacks, right? So I threw a couple of statistics up here and the second item up here states that 94% of breaches were because of weak passwords, right? That's crazy. So when you think about the, the things we've heard recently in the news, and if you read and investigated any of them, you find that passwords still tend to be a point of problem, 
which is crazy. We're in 2017. Um, if we take a look at how we should be improving security, it's with multiple layers, right? So we start putting intelligence behind these layers and we need to start with the applications, right? So whatever endpoint device are running on, we only want to run trusted applications. Seems like a good goal. The next layer is we want to protect um, our domain credentials, right? This is super important, our passwords, even if the machine is compromised. Think about that, right? So if your machine has been compromised, how can you protect your domain credentials? And then for the third item, the intelligent protection is to run as close to real-time behavior-based analytics and respond to those threats as quickly as possible, which seems like a very daunting task. <clears throat> All of them need to take into account all of the security aspects as well as improving our user experience because we want to make technology easy to consume for our end users and security is is only good if people are using the devices right so i'm sure you've heard people say we can lock it down really 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 um tightly but it becomes a horrible user experience right we could have five factor authentication to get to email if you'd like it's probably not going to get hacked but it's really unusable at that point. And overall, the goal of our security is to not get owned, right? We got to stay patched. It is super important to stay patched. It is super important to stay updated. And so you're probably asking yourself, you're like, all right, I know all of this stuff already. These are things that we have maybe in our 2018, 2019 goals. But, you know, how does Windows 10 help us with these goals? And so, what I've done is I've kind of mapped features that you may have heard about into um, technology in Windows 10 that exists today, right? And so if you only want to run trusted applications, there's of course been AppLocker for years and, and uh, that's still a thing that you can run, but there are ways to circumvent AppLocker. But now there's this new functionality called Device Guard that I will go into depth about because it's it's very important to understand it. I've actually had to unwind it already from somebody that erroneously put it together. The second bullet there is to secure your machines even if you've been compromised, right? Um, this is probably the easiest win in the Windows 10 column, which is Credential Guard. And we'll explain what that means here in a minute. Next, we wanna actively manage our threats and respond to them as quickly as possible. So we'll talk about Defender ATP. And then we wanna improve user experience while keeping in mind security. And so we should look at the Windows Hello for Business um, aspect of, of authentication. So let's talk a little bit about Device Guard, okay? So Device Guard presents end users of the device from executing anything malicious on accident as an example, right? So you can save on operational fire drills and oftentimes it's not intentional that people execute these malicious files, right? The source code can look like someone you know and trust. I actually got an email from my wife last week that was not my wife and she said, click on this link and it just seemed awfully suspicious. So I didn't. Um, as we, uh, as IT professionals, we need to remove that ability to inadvertently create harm from our end users. Now, a couple of pieces about device guard. And so um, I don't have slides for this. I'm just gonna kind of talk to you because I think it's important to understand device guard is there's a couple of ways to implement it and you do it through use of code signing policies and use of TPM chips, okay? So it's in a hardware layer. Now you can manage that through group policy. You cannot unmanage it through group policy. It becomes increasingly difficult to unwind it. So when you think about piloting this, pilot to a very small test group of folks. Uh, furthermore, and I think it's a, as of 1709, it might be as, as of 1702 or 1703, whatever the config man build is, um, you can manage device guard policies in SCCM. Again, I cannot um, communicate enough about the dangers of device guard as I've had to go through and, um, and unwind it in an organization already. And so, as this technology and management of this technology gets further along, you'll eventually have a single source of authority where anything that's going to run from a, an application perspective on the machine is sourced from, in, in 
in the Microsoft realm from SCCM. Now, it doesn't have to be a Microsoft app. It can be anything. But you would create code integrity policies and deploy them to machines that allow these things to run. And I can tell you with a very high degree of certainty, of, as I've seen it firsthand, if it's not allowed to run, it will not run. So Device Guard is a very, very cool feature built into Windows 10 Enterprise. It takes a group policy to light it up. But the bigger piece of it is more the management and ongoing operations of it. So something very cool to look at, to research, to start piloting in your organizations. But you need to have Windows 10 Enterprise for that. OK, next on, uh, Credential Guard. So Credential Guard is if your machine gets owned, gets compromised, um, a lot of the ways that if you've heard of the man in the middle or patch the hash attacks, pass the hash attacks, I say that a lot. Um, then the way they do it is they actually crack into LSAS and they steal your password hash and then they can do a replay attack. So they can bounce it off a domain controller and say, hey, here's my password hash and the domain controller will authenticate them as, as you because they have your hash, right? That's just how that, that process works. And so Credential Guard um, basically virtualizes the LSAS process and by virtualizing it, um, you are no longer able to access um, the hash file. So, and I'll, I'll show you a screenshot of something that I pulled from, from the web. You can run through these demos and kind of look at these pieces, but by virtualizing LSAS, um, the, the use cases for this are very strong. And it's actually got a sub process that for older legacy apps that try to call LSAS directly that will actually pipe through the virtual LSAS. So I have yet to see something where it doesn't work by doing this. To light this up as a group policy again, its risk is pretty minimal um, from an organizational standpoint. We've had several customers already implement this. If nothing else, it's an extra peace of mind. Um, if you get um, owned internally or if you have a lot of construction sites, retail shops, healthcare clinics, or traveling sales folks that may have machines exposed to the general population of people, um, this can prevent a lot of damage in your organization. And so if your business has a lot of those endpoints that are exposed and have uh, a pretty high degree of, uh, of attacks uh, against the password hashes that you may or may not know, this is an easy win with group policy. And so here's that screenshot I was referring to. And so the the red piece of it has no um, credential guard um, involved in it. So you can see that the NTLM hash is here. And then on the other side, um, it's just not present, right? When the, on the left, where it says password is, where does it add the Kerberos password widgets? Yeah, the NTLM hash doesn't even exist on the, on the green side. And so when you start looking at that, that's a very common way to do a replay attack and to get in, into your environment as a hacker. And so that doesn't exist anymore once it's virtualized. Let that kind of soak in for a moment. It's again, easy to light up and a very low risk to, uh, to execute on. So now, um, now that we're running trusted applications and we've made it difficult to steal our credentials, we need a more intelligent way of fighting malicious software by using things like behavior-based analytics um, uh, that take a lot of these heuristics from a lot of different organizations and can help us um, make, yes, Jeffrey, the, it will be recorded. It's being recorded right now. So the, um, the behavior-based analytics from Defender ATP basically gives you a private instance in Azure for your Defender portal, uh, takes data from your devices, and then puts them into Azure and runs some analytics against them. And so um, I've got, we have a whole session based on Defender ATP because it's a big thing to cover. Um, but you can do forensic investigation to the degree of what process is running, when it was executed, who executed that process, what else did that touch? So you can see that I've got a bunch of examples we'll go through when it's time to do the ATP um, longer conversation. But uh, basically, you can run PowerShell. And if the PowerShell is malicious in any way and it's touching other things in your organization, you can find what it's touched, what it's doing. You can actually shut that agent down, right? So now you can take some 
some action against your devices in your organization after you've identified that, hey, this is running malicious code without any other way of knowing that it is other than getting all the machine heuristics up into Azure from not only your organization, but from all, everyone else running ATP. So you can identify threats in a much, much more uh, more quickly than you used to be able to in your organization, see what those threats have done in your organization, and then take action upon those threats. Right? Um, it's got a built-in knowledge base, and it's got a, some built-in pieces to assign incidents to folks. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's in there, but it is it is worth the, when we go through the um, ATP components, um, certainly, certainly worth it. So um, basically, it's pretty easy to onboard. It's a script, and you onboard that script, uh, push it out through a CCM or group policy, whatever makes the most sense, and it's just Windows Defender. There's nothing else to install, so it's already built in, but you basically onboard it with a script, and then it starts sending data into your dedicated ATP tenant, and then you hit it through the, the portal, so it's a service. The, the nice thing about it is the information is coming from a variety of sources, from industry collaborators, monitoring and reporting, ATP hunters, all that stuff goes into your ATP tenant and helps you make sense of your data. You can even right click and request that something be investigated further by the team, which is really cool stuff. So now you can say, I don't know what this is, I can't find anything about it, we need to investigate it. Cool stuff. All right. So password challenges, which again, in 2017, it's pretty interesting here. Um, does ATP work with the enterprise version only? Um, we should probably verify that, but I believe that that is the case. I know it requires a an E5 subscription, I think, and Jeff can probably touch better on that. I'll, I'll get some uh, information for you while you're talking. Thank you. So, uh, password challenges. So, 20 character passwords can be a nightmare for users and it can make the environment unusable. So, you could look at doing things like MFA, which is a great use for um, securing resources, which we actually have a, an entire section on um, coming up on that. But if you look at the, um, the strong pa the password challenges, right? So, Security breaches can expose network credentials, right? Passwords can be stolen if they're stored in a database or they can be um, difficult for users to remember. Just some common password issues, right? Replay attacks can occur with passwords. So if you didn't implement Credential Guard and you still have LSAS kind of hanging out there with your password hash exposed, then replay attacks can occur with passwords. Additionally, you have a biometric sign-in, and for years we've wanted the biometric sign-ins to be really, really solid and to work as you needed them to work. Um, but the technology has been a challenge, and I know some people have implemented it, and I'm always interested in hearing feedback, but you know, it's kind of hit or miss with some of the thumbprint finger readers, uh, fingerprint readers, it, how that actually goes. But um, Additionally, passwords are not two-factor, right? So it's just a single way to authenticate to get in. And we need an easier way to authenticate with two-factor, right? And so Windows Hello for Business um, is quite an infrastructure to set up if you're gonna replace these, the entire authentication process in your organization. So passwords are no longer a thing that you would need and use. You would use things like Azure Active Directory services, certificates, and the Windows for Business Hello infrastructure to actually secures your endpoints and enhances your user experience. I don't know if anybody's done the um, what's called a convenience pin or a convenience of hello for Surface or Surface Book where you do the facial recognition. Um, I haven't had to type my password to log in for quite some time, but that just replaces the authentication in. You still have to use passwords to get around your network. You can actually set up Windows Hello for Business um, to do corporate um, authentication. And so through remote infrastructure and access to make it make passwords kind of thing of the past. So no more, you know, missing your long complex password or having to do password resets. I can't tell you how many organizations just have a ton of help desk tickets on password resets. But if you were able to negate that and use something like Windows Hello for Business to where your two factor is, you have to have the device which has a TPM chip, okay? 
So your face is only good on that device or your fingerprint would only be good on that device. Um, so the two factors would be you and the device to get into the infrastructures. Whereas a password, if you have someone's password today, you can probably go to any domain join machine and log in with that password. So there's the single authentication piece of it. So it's kind of a new way to think about um, the, um, the Windows or the two-factor authentication, but it's certainly worth digging in for a pilot. Um, how many organizations are using Hello for Business and getting it right? That's a great question. So I can tell you there's a ton of interest in it. I think the um, setup of it is, is complicated and requires a, um, a slew of people to operationalize it initially and to make sure that all the pieces and components are working. Um, but I couldn't tell you how many people are using it. Jeff may know better from his customer base. I can tell you we've implemented it a couple of times to, to test it, um, mostly for pilots. Yeah, we, we have it deployed here at, at Microsoft and it works really well. I probably know of about 10 customers that are currently using uh, Windows Hello or at least uh, evaluating it right now. So, uh, and, and that's part of what the, this conversation is going to be about. I think there's a lack of awareness around it. So that's why we're, yep. the reason why we're doing this. That's right. Um, so overall, when we talk about security in Windows 10 that it brings, so ideally you're going to get a better user experience, right? So facial recognition, biometrics can be a way to get a better user experience um, as, as far as superior than typing and login credentials. Um, increased security. So if you have a lot of these pieces put in place, whether it's credential guard, eventually you put device guard in place. Um, some of those little pieces through group policies to manage can increase your security significantly. Um, if you think about minimizing your attack surface, so you've minimized it by basically virtualizing LSAS and Credential Guard, you're now maybe using a PIN, a four-digit PIN that is only good to this device. So even if your PIN was stolen and the device wasn't, or one or the other, um, it's not going to work for anybody that has stolen it. And then you're actively managing. You're trying to get into a more active managed state with Defender ATP, um, with the portal and the analytics that you're getting. So overall, you're much more aware with increased security and a better user experience. Now, there's a lot of technology that goes into this. But again, understanding that all this exists inside of Windows 10, I think, is the important piece here. And so we're going to talk for a moment about some remote workforce challenges, because this ties into security a couple of ways. Um, it also um, kind of sheds a new light on, on making infrastructure um, more of a, a value add to the business and less of a um, maybe of a utility or a plumbing to the business, right? So let's take a look at an example of what a traditional infrastructure may look like. And so you have your end user that's mobile, they have the internet, and they maybe hit a VPN, or maybe you've got internet-based client management sitting out there for SCCM. So you manage applications that way, and they're managed in Active Directory. Well, there's a slew of challenges with this. Um, passwords can be a challenge with this. Um, slow networks over DMZ can be a challenge with this. Management can be a challenge with this. Patching can be a challenge with this. All the challenges exist with this and it's the way that many people are doing it. But here's an example of a modern approach, um, what I call a hybrid approach. And so this can be used in a, a slew of scenarios, but if you have a Windows 10 Pro or higher device, you can Azure AD join the device. So now it doesn't require any infrastructure on-prem. And then that can auto enroll you into Intune as of the latest edition of SCCM. I don't know if it's beta or if they just announced it, but you can co-manage an SCCM and Intune, which is kind of a cool feature. Um, you can all—you've always been able to integrate the two, but co-management is going to be um, a, a cool thing to kind of dive into. But once they're enrolled in Intune, you can then push your standard config. So whether that's redirecting their documents in my desktop to their one terabyte of free storage on their OneDrive for Business, or it's pushing out their ten applications that are super important to them. Um, it's all managed the same way you would manage your internal infrastructure, but now with a set of modern tools. So in this case, we could take a, a sales resource or 
you know, anything really, let's, let's take a salesperson and say that they lose their laptop or they break it or it's stolen. Today, they may have to ship it to IT or go to an office and get a new one, or there's probably some period of time that they've lost productivity in that, that scenario, not to mention some costs for shipping and et cetera. In this scenario, it's really just a matter of getting a Windows 10 Pro higher or um, Pro or higher device Azure AD joining it, which is a one page set of instructions with their email address and their email credentials, and the rest just kind of happens for them, right? So it, it's less important with that remote workforce of, and of setting up a standard image, getting the applications right, and making sure that they have that build. It's more important that they get to be productive with reduced downtime than it is to have those things. And so it's a different way to think about a workforce and how you manage it today, but it does solve quite a few problems. I can tell you that we do both at Model to where we have people that are joined through our Azure AD and enrolled in Intune. We have conditional access, so that's the only way they get their email. On their device, they have to be enrolled. On their Windows 10 device, they have to be enrolled, so we control it, which means we put policies in place, right? So we put passwords in place. We, put, we have the ability to wipe the device if we need to. We don't ever need them to come into the office and join our Active Directory or come in and get the SCCM client because we can fully manage them through through Intune and SCCM integrated. Um, so there's there's some benefits in doing this, but it is again a new way of kind of thinking. So it takes the infrastructure piece and adds a more beneficial kind of spin to it than just maybe hey we're keeping the lights on. We're now enabling business, reducing downtime, providing other ways to manage right. Um, so again, reduce downtime to lost, broken, or stolen equipment, save money by eliminating double shipping, enable users, ensure the users are patched regardless of where they're located, so that whole modern piece to it, right? So the last piece that I think we're going to go through, which is super important that everyone understands on the phone that exists, is what to expect when you adopt Windows 10. It's important to understand the benefits, and it's, but it's equally as important to understand what it takes to operationalize it in your organization, right? And so if we take a look at deployment efforts, I'm guessing everyone's heard of the deployment effort is continuous now, <clears throat> but, and it might seem a bit terrifying that the old effort of deploying operating system really felt significant, right? And so over the last 17 years or so, um, the amount of effort here for apps, infrastructure, imaging, and deployment has kind of went up and down depending on the operating system. And the idea is that things are going to get easier to deploy, right? So the deployment, the infrastructure, and the apps are all going to be minimal updates. But if you think in terms of what it took to get you from Windows XP to Windows 7, it was probably what would be considered a major project that was planned out very well. And that took some period of months to get through an update. Once you got to Windows 7, then you kind of said, all right, we're good for the next X amount of years until the latest release, right? Well, one thing to note is that these feature updates um, from Windows 10 are going to be coming. I think they're, they've settled on two times a year now, which are spring and fall. And you can, you can denote that by the 1703 and 1709. So March of 2017 and September of 2017 were the two releases in 2017. Um, the idea is that they're going to have less updates overall and should reduce the impact of those applications that are running. Um, the monthly updates, the quality updates on the right, they're the hot fixes, security patches, they're going to be all inclusive. And so patching is still going to be required, but if a PC is off for a long period of time, you only need to install the one quality update. Now, the two to three times release per year is very, very new. And so I don't know if this is the first time everyone's heard about this. Um, while the terminology on this slide might be a little dated because um, they've changed it again, it does make it easier to understand. And so let's take 1709. So 1709 um, Windows 10 was released. And so there basically there's an 18 month total deployment cycle that you have, okay? Once you're out of the 18 months, 1709 and any other operating system will no longer get patches. Now, what does that mean to you? That means that you have to continually pilot and deploy Windows 10 and the iterations because you only have a life cycle, a lifespan entirely. The entire lifespan of Windows 10 is 18 months. 
So if you deploy 1709 today and you get it all deployed, I don't know, by January, you should start working on your next iteration of your operating system, get it into a pilot to get sign off, um, start with your most adaptable users and get it deployed to your least adaptable users and then get off of 1709 within a year, within 13, 14 months. Otherwise, you won't be able to patch it. And this is just going to continue to happen. And there's several reasons for this, but the idea is that to adopt new technology, to enable business, to um, provide the, the best user experience, it's, it's just kind of a, it's a change in mindset to um, wait two or three years to deploy an operating system. And if you think about your phones, which is my, my favorite example, when you get an update to your iOS or to your Android, you get a little bubble and it says, hey, your update's ready. And you click the update and now you have the latest feature sets. You may like them, you may not care, but at least now you're patched and you're on the latest feature sets of that device. The same thing is happening inside of our, our desktops for our, our business environments. So those releases are coming twice a year. You don't have to go to every release, but that should be in continuous development, determining what release you're gonna be on next and when you're gonna get there. Now the updates overall will upgrade pretty seamlessly back and forth, but you should test all the applications, get sign off and pilot it however you are going to do in your organization. If you're at the point where you can just push it down and have a bubble that reminds them to do this at some point, great. A lot of organizations are not there yet. A lot of organizations are more on the boat of, we're gonna handle this after hours. We're gonna handle this on, you know, in an outage window. We're gonna send communications to the user. I think that will eventually kind of dissipate into a, everybody's just used to it and they have to update their Windows 10 at some point, like you do your phones today. But I don't know if you're there yet from an organization or not, but I can tell you from a deployment perspective, and again, these terminolo these, this terminology here has been kind of deprecated, but um, the idea is that you have a preview ring. So in 1709, we'll use that as an example, you should be, IT should have a, um, a, a preview image of it, right? So non-production machines, it's used for testing images. You're getting the group policies ready. You're making sure SCCM is ready. You're testing it, right? And then ring one is maybe a further expansion of IT for testing. Ring two would be your friendly business guests for testing. Ring three would be your broader IT personnel or maybe your friendlies of IT into a more production environment. Ring four is out to the mass amounts of people. And then ring five is the remainder of the population, maybe your least adaptable users. As well. And so are you saying that Microsoft's not gonna report previous releases if you're not ready even after 18 months? Thought this was incentive to upgrade. If not, then what is the incentive to upgrade? So take, for example, 1511. 1511 will not get updates of Windows 10. I think it's after this month. So in a couple of days, they unless they've extended it, that maybe they have, but I don't believe they have. So 1511 was released in uh, November of 2015. And if you have that operating system in your environment, it will likely not be getting patches here come December. So if you were on that version, you will not get patched, right? So they are going to start enforcing that cadence. That it was supposed to happen a while ago, but they extended it into a grace period. Um, but as you think of adopting Windows 10 in your environment, staying on a, um, a supported build is, is the important thing to note. So having a way to get insight into those builds, um, my favorite is SCCM, and then managing that to get it ready to deploy, testing the deployment, testing the apps, and then updating it in some period of time, you have an 18 month window to do so. Does that answer your question? I'll make sure I got that answered. Um, so yeah, so that's a big educational piece that I find a lot of people still don't um, fully understand, but it's important to understand it because you will find yourself vulnerable to um, exploits if, if that's not fully comprehended. So, um, so with that, that was a very tip of the iceberg uh, security conversation that we, we just had with new features that were announced, timelines that were announced, some new technology. Um, so, 
They've also got breadsticks. Oh, and I think we're on hold. Stop by the Grand Island, Nebraska, Bosselman Travel Center and check. Does anyone else hear that, or is that just me? No, it's not just you. No, I can hear it. I'm trying to find it and mute it. Okay. Your call is important to us, and we'll be with you shortly. Okay. So um, now is the time to ask questions. So you can either – I would probably request you <laughs> – now I want pizza. <laughs> hey, there's seven ninety nine on sale right now. Um, so – uh, now I would ask your questions. I put them in the chat window so we can take them as they come in. Uh, might be an easier method to go through. Saloon and Steakhouse in Big Spring. Our oh, Max steakhouse. Highway Diner in Altoona, Iowa, serves up breakfast, burgers, and barbecue. Plus, Jeff, who's from Iowa? And treats from our soda jerk. I'm, not, I'm trying to find them. I'm sorry. I'm looking for the person right now. I didn't look to find the mute all. I don't hear it anymore. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's gone. Um, I think it is a great philosophy and strategy in changing our behavior when it comes to, to releases. Yeah, that's for sure. And so that's a good point that Jesse makes that, you know, it is a change in philosophy and is a change in strategy and likely it'll require different operations. And so, you know, I likened it to what you've done in the past, which took several months, has now got to get condensed into, or maybe even a year, it's got to get condensed into several months for ready to be tested. And it should be less work once you get the infrastructure and get it operationalized and figure it out. Um, but yeah, it's going to have to change your strategy and philosophy, and it might drive user behavior too, in that maybe you don't have to do things as much in outage windows, and you can enable self-service of, of things a lot more as you kind of go on. But it's a really good point. Any other questions? Yeah, so if, if there aren't, or if there are, um, you can find more about Model at our website, model-technology, or please email me. Um, if you have any questions, you want to talk more in depth about something, and I know Jeff is the same way, so if you want to email Jeff, he'll he'll direct you to the right internal Microsoft personnel when it comes to things that you need. Yeah, and I do want to say, you know, for and, and I, I make this blanket statement kind of cautiously, but we, we do have a lot of... Uh, incentives uh, for assessments, proof of concepts around Windows 10 and our security uh, workshops and briefings. So there's a number of different uh, um, services, free uh, kind of consulting that we can provide to our customers now around Windows 10, around our security strategy. So if you do want to get educated and would like to spend a little bit of time, a few days with a consultant like, like Jason, please let us know. We can definitely go into this a little bit deeper. We offer up lunch and learns, uh, a series of assessments, as I said, proof of concepts, what have you, that can help you get a little bit deeper on this and see if it's going to be uh, effective and help you plan for your Windows 10 migration in your, uh, in your environment. So uh, if you do have interest in any of those things, please reach out to me. You can reach out directly to Jason, and we can help you out with that. Hey, Jeff, we have a question. How will they get a copy of this recording? How are you going to be able to post that? Um, okay, so anyone that I, I have a list of people, you know, so I have so, uh, anyone that accepted this email, um, I, I can send it to. However, I do have a lot of, uh, of uh, phone numbers on here rather than actual uh, people's names with email addresses. So um, I will send the, the uh, recording out to um, everyone that I have. Uh, uh, email addresses for. If you need one specifically, if, if I don't have it, either put your email address in the IM window or you can send me an email at jeffkaz at microsoft.com, J-E-F-F-K-A-Z at microsoft.com, and I will make sure you get it. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, the Pro 2 is incompatible with the, the cameras. Um, Pro 4s, uh, as Craig said, I think the those are compatible. I know my Surface Book is compatible. Um, there's other devices that have it, but I think it's a 
I forgot what the name of the camera is. I don't know if it's an infrared or a 3D or um, it's a special kind of camera that enables the facial recognition for it. Uh, it is Jeff. Here, let's throw Jeff's email in the chat. Beach two at that time. Yeah, so please send that over to me, Robert. Man, you're faster I'll make typing sure you get it on. A copy of this as soon as we get down here. I'll uh, I'll download the recording and and publish it. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone, and feel free to shoot me an email if you have any feedback or if you want to have a deeper conversation. Yeah. And this is just the first in a four-part series around security that Jason's going to be hosting for us. Um, everyone on this call, as well as the majority of our customers, will receive a, a, a similar uh, webinar invitation uh, for phase two of this. But this is going to be a four-part uh, series that we're doing together to get you educated on our security strategy and how you can better leverage it. So thanks again to, to Jason and the team at Model for uh, spending the time here. Hopefully we you guys found this to be uh, educational and helpful uh, in terms of getting your job done and, uh, and planning your migrations. And if you need any more information, let us know. But uh, Jason, anything else you wanted to add before I turn off the recording? Um, no, I think, I think we're good there. I'm okay. always interested in feedback, so feel free to drop me a line. Yep, absolutely. And and Jason, you're available to do demos and deeper dives and have conversations with uh, with anybody on the call, correct? <coughs> you bet. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. So uh, this includes uh, uh, meeting number one on our uh, se uh, security conversation around uh, Windows 10 and the Microsoft All-Up Security Strategy. I want to thank everybody for spending the time with us uh, this morning, and uh, we will get the recording out. And any other questions, you can reach directly out to me or Jason. Great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful uh, Wednesday, and uh, uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks.